Grace and peace be to each of you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus, who is indeed the Christ, the anointed one of God, and let us pray. Good and gracious Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. It is a day that you have made, and we rejoice in it. Lord, we rejoice in your word, which is ancient and new at the same time. Lord, we bless you. We thank you that you have preserved your word throughout the centuries and the millennia. We thank you, Lord, that it is a word that can refresh us and renew us and strengthen us. And we thank you, Lord, that you know, you're continuing to use it to our betterment and the betterment of the world. We ask you now to anoint my tongue to declare this word this morning that you've given me and anoint every ear that hears it to receive it. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, last week, we began John chapter 18, and we read that Jesus was arrested and taken before Annas. It was during Jesus' time before Annas that we read that Peter denied Jesus three times. When we ended last week's message, Jesus was being led from Annas, Caiaphas' father-in-law, to Caiaphas. Today we begin by hearing, then they led Jesus from Caiaphas to the praetorium and it was early morning. Now we don't actually get to hear any of the exchange that Jesus had before Caiaphas. If we want to hear that particular exchange, we've got to go to Matthew's Gospel. But in John's Gospel, we don't get to hear that exchange. We get to hear what happened before Annas. What is, in, what is interesting is that the exchange before the high priest is before Caiaphas. If we are looking at Matthew's Gospel, I know I'm interchanging Matthew and Luke right now, but we need to see this. Uh, because sometimes, you know, when we read our Bible, sometimes we can get to be a little confused because the synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John don't always agree on everything. And in Matthew's Gospel, Jesus stands before Caiaphas, and it's during that time before Caiaphas that Peter denies Jesus three times. So in Luke, I mean, in John, Jesus is before Annas, and Peter denies him three times, but in you know, Matthew, he's before Caiaphas, and Peter denies Jesus three times. So you kind of wonder, you know, what's going on here? And I really think that one of the things was is that the gospel writers didn't really care the timing of Peter's denial, whether it was before Annas or before Caiaphas. What the gospel writers wanted to do was just say, Peter did it, and Jesus had said he would. And so... We in the West, remember that the Bible is written for Eastern thinking people. Uh, we in the West get bent out of shape for little details like, well, who was he really standing before? What was he doing? People in, you know, with an Eastern mindset don't have that hang up. And so we just say, Peter did it. Jesus said he would and he did. So... In John's Gospel, getting back to John, Jesus goes from Annas to Caiaphas. We don't hear anything about what goes on there. And then to the Roman Praetorium where Jesus will face Pontius Pilate. What I find interesting at this point is that the Jews actually didn't need to bring Jesus before Pilate to kill him. What do I mean? Well, hadn't the Jews brought a woman caught in adultery to, to Jesus, knowing that according to Jews, Jewish law, she could be stoned? Sure. Hadn't they tried, at least at one point, maybe several, to throw Jesus over a cliff? Which, had they done that, they would have pelted him with stones from above. Yes. In Acts chapter 7, didn't the Jews stone Stephen? Yes. So apparently the practice of stoning was still in use. The practice of capital punishment was still in use. However, it seems that the Jews didn't have stoning in mind. But I've gotten ahead of myself. Of what John has to say regarding 
the death Jesus would die. So let's get back to the text. Continue in verse 28, we read, But they, the Jewish leaders, themselves did not go into the praetorium, lest they should be defiled, but that they might eat the Passover. You know, these men apparently do not recognize the hypocrisy of what they are doing. The Jewish leaders are plotting and planning the death of Jesus, which of course is breaking the commandments of God. Thou shalt not kill. Which generally speaking, if we look at that particular commandment, thou shalt not murder. They were planning and plotting the murder of Jesus. And yet, they wanted to keep themselves ceremonially clean so that they could eat the Passover. That's ridiculous. That's hypocrisy. Doesn't make any sense, but evil often doesn't make sense. Well, since the Jews didn't want to become unclean, we read in verse 29, Pilate went out to them and said, What accusations do you bring against this, against this man? Well, guess what? They don't give him any accusations. They just say, they answered and said to him, If he were not an evildoer, we would not have him delivered up to you. Cop out. Then Pilate said to them, you take him and judge him by according to your law. So see, Pilate knows that the Jews have a law. The Jews have stated that Jesus is a lawbreaker, an evildoer, which he wasn't. But they wanted to get rid of him. Continuing verse 31, we read, Therefore the Jews said to him, it is not lawful for us to put anyone to death. Right that the saying of Jesus might be fulfilled, which he spoke, signifying what death he would die. Now, commentators do not agree on whether or not it was lawful for the Jews to put anyone to death. I mentioned earlier that, sure, they did. They did it all the time. However, what the Jewish leaders could not do is that they could not crucify anybody. That type of execution belonged to the Romans. So why would the Jewish leaders want, to cru want Jesus crucified? Well, one, it gets Rome involved. And this could possibly serve the purpose of limiting any kind of backlash from Jesus' many followers. After all, who in their right mind would rise up against Rome? That would be suicide. Two, it fulfills scripture. In fact, it fulfills two prophecies. One spoken by Moses and the other one spoken by Jesus. The first one spoken by Moses is found in Deuteronomy 21. There we read, If a man has committed a sin deserving of death and he is put to death and you hang him on a tree, his body shall not remain overnight on the tree, but you shall surely bury him that day, so that you do not defile the land which the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance. For he who is hanged is accursed by God. Paul writes of the fulfillment of this passage in Galatians 3.13. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. The second prophecy is spoken by Jesus in John 3 and actually John 12. To Nicodemus, Jesus says, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so much must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. The second occasion of Jesus mentioning the way he will die is Palm Sunday, after some Greeks came to Philip asking to see Jesus. There Jesus said, And I, if I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all peoples to myself. This he said signifying by what death he would die. Jesus came to fulfill the law and the prophets. He came to fulfill all that had been written concerning him. And, you know, who was the author of all that was written concerning him? Well, the Father. That's who. He came to fulfill everything the Father had given him to do. So it was God who determined long before creation 
uh, that his son would die a very humiliating and excruciating death on the tree of the cross so that every man, woman, and child on earth might have their sins forgiven. Verse 33, Then Pilate entered the praetorium again, called Jesus, and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? Pilate's question is actually very interesting. Because not a whole lot is mentioned in John's gospel regarding Jesus being the king of the Jews. In Matthew's gospel, we hear the Magi from the east coming to Herod and ask him, asking, where is he who has been born king of the Jews? In Mark's gospel, there apparently were some who referred to Jesus as the king of the Jews because Pilate answered and said to the crowd again, what then do you want me to do with him whom you call the king of the Jews? And in Luke's gospel at his trial, we hear someone say to Pilate, we found this fellow perverting the nation and forbidding to pay taxes to Caesar, saying he himself is Christ, a king. So we can probably conclude that Pilate had heard at least something of what was being said about Jesus in Jerusalem. He is, after all, the Roman governor. He's supposed to keep his hands, you know, kind of his ear to the ground and such things. We don't exactly know what, but we can presume that. Still, it's interesting, so much so that Jesus answered him in verse 34, Are you speaking for yourself about this, or did others tell you this concerning me? Apparently, Jesus wants to know how Pilate would ask the question. Verse 35, Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Your own nation and the chief priests have delivered you to me. What have you done? Pilate's question is a very good question. What had Jesus done? Well, Jesus had done nothing deserving his death. He was blameless. Nevertheless, he was born to die. On a side note, you know, as we have already mentioned, today marks the beginning of this year's Advent season, and we remember that Advent reminds us that Jesus came to earth, born in Bethlehem, wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. Is that where the you know, shepherds found him? We love to hear the Christmas hymns and carols, and we love to sing them. We love to hear the story of Jesus' birth. You know, most believers cannot get enough of the Christmas carols and so forth. But nevertheless, we've got to remember that Jesus was born to die. You know, he came to take upon himself our sins, our guilt, our shame. And so in the hustle and bustle of the secular Christmas celebrations, we've got to remember that there would be no Christmas were it not for the fact that Christ was born and he was born to die for us. So Jesus now answers Pilate's question of what have you done? Jesus answered, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight so that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now my kingdom is not from here. Pilate therefore said to him, are you a king then? Jesus answered, you say rightly that I am a king. For this cause I was born, and for this cause I have come into the world, that I should bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. These words are extremely interesting. Let me read Jesus' two sections here again. My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight so that I should not be delivered to the Jews, but now my kingdom is not from here. You say rightly that I am a king. For this cause I was born, and for this cause I came into the world, that I should bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. Jesus makes four extremely important points. First, his kingdom is not of this world. It's not of this world. Second, he came to make his kingship known 
in this world. For though in this world there are still many kind of kings, Jesus is the king of kings. So he came to make his kingship known. His rule, his kingship surpasses all kingships. Third, he came to bear witness to the truth. What's interesting about this third point is that Jesus came to bear witness to the truth because um, when Adam and Eve sinned, truth in this world was lost. Because truth was lost to this world, someone had to come into this world from the outside in order to bear witness to the truth. Okay, that someone is Jesus. I mean, do you really get this? Truth didn't exist in the world because the fall into sin. So Jesus had to come and bring it into the world. Fourth, the last thing Jesus told Pilate, everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. This is an interesting statement. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. Are we to conclude then that there are some in the world who are not of the truth? I would answer that question with a yes. There are some in the world who are not of the truth. So they cannot hear Jesus' voice. Who are these who are not of the truth? Well, the answer to that question would be those who are of the serpent's seed. What? You see, the serpent has offspring. The serpent has seed. We hear that he would have seed. We hear that he would have offspring already back in Genesis chapter 3. After our first parents sinned, uh, God said to the serpent, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. So Jesus actually, in John chapter 8, he appears to be fingering some of the Pharisees as seed, as offspring, of the serpent. I'm sure we all remember the exchange. Let me read it though. Jesus said to them, you know, the Pharisees who were questioning him at this particular moment, if God were your father, you would love me. For I proceeded forth and came from God. Nor have I come of myself, but he sent me. Why do you not understand my speech? Because you are not able to listen to my word. You are of your father the devil. And the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth. Because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources. For he is a liar and the father of it. But because I tell the truth, you do not believe me. We probably all also remember... The parable of the sower in the field from Matthew chapter 13. Let me read that one. Another parable he put forth to them. To them, The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. But when the grain had sprouted and produced a crop, then the tares also appeared. So the servants of the owner came and said to him, Sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have tares? He said to them, An enemy has done this. The servants said to him, Do you want us to go then and gather them up? But he said to them, No, lest while you gather up the tares, you also uproot the wheat with them. Let them both grow together until the harvest. And at the time of harvest, I will say to the reapers, first gather together the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them. But gather the wheat into my barn. All of this is to say that the serpent has offspring. And those who belong to him, they are not of the truth. And so they cannot hear Jesus' voice. The tares and the wheat are growing up together. Some can hear, some cannot hear Jesus' voice. 
St. Pilate said to him, what is truth? Pilate has asked a very good question, and uh, he doesn't stick around for the answer. So Jesus doesn't have a chance to answer that question. I personally believe that Jesus would have said, I am the truth. Because he is. Okay? Um, but Jesus has already stated, I have come into the world that I should bear witness to the truth. Okay? Now, commentators, the commentators that I read yesterday, didn't offer much help regarding Pilate's question. Several presumed that Pilate asked Jesus a question in a somewhat mocking manner. If this is the case, then we might conclude that truth was rare in Jerusalem in Jesus' day. Or maybe, and this is probably more likely, that when somebody was brought before Pilate, um, because their life was probably on the line, they probably weren't going to tell the truth. They'd probably make something up to get off the hook. So, he's probably pretty, got a, you know, he's probably got a pretty good, eh, about truth. But apparently, he's heard enough from Jesus, and uh, when he had said what is truth, he went out again to the Jews and said to them, I find no fault in him at all. We're going to stop at this point today. We're going to continue with John 18 next week. And I'm going to say amen. Amen.